hope you're ready and rested for more data structures. Um, those of you, thank you to everyone who filled out the, the partner survey. Uh, those of you who have new partners uh, have received an email from me. Everyone else, if you have not received an email from me about a partner, you will have the same partner as before. Uh, also, thank you to those of you who filled out uh, the um, midterm feedback survey. Uh, there was one uh, uh, question that came in through that that I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, since it was about uh, a common thing in, in Java that I uh, skipped over in class uh, when talking about this association class. Uh, we saw something in this constructor uh, that is different from Java code we have seen in other constructors, only this dot key equals key. And what's going on here is that the parameter to the constructor and the field of the class have the same name. And so if I were to just say key equals key, it, Java is warning me that this assignment has no effect because both of these keys refer to this parameter. And so if I have a parameter to a method that is the same, uh, that has the same name as a field of that class. To differentiate between the two, I can put this dot in front of the one that refers to the field. So if you've used objects in, in Python and we're used to having self dot, uh, this is Java's version of self. And so if I change these parameter names to be different from the names of the fields, then I could do away with the use of this entirely. So the only reason uh, that uh, I needed that uh, special term this was to differentiate between the local variable named key and the field of the class named key. Does that make sense? Any any questions on what's going on here? All right, where we left off before the break, we were talking about uh, maps and hashing. So a couple uh, review questions, sort of get our get our heads back into what's going on here. So hope you remember our list map implementation, implementing our kind of put and get and contains and remove operations uh, are the ones we would associate with the map abstract data type using a linked list. Uh, and the sad thing was all of these methods turned out to be to be linear, to be big O of N. So take a moment and think about why was it that to put a new key value pair into our map or to get the value associated with a key that was in the map. Why were these things all linear? We always were having to kind of loop through all the associations in our list uh, to find what we were looking for. Elena. Why is the first A list of associations is slower than a list of strings or integers. So in order to find, uh, so, so we had this linked list of, of associations. And uh, let me just pull up the code. That would make sense. We had our linked list of associations. And we had this find key uh, method that looped through all, like looped over all the things in our linked list, uh, checking if it could find one where the key of that association was equal to some key we were looking for. And 
what was the like uh, the the big O of this loop? Uh, uh, what was that? Yeah, if we have n things in our list, in the worst case, we have, we loop through all n of them, uh, and. It does not actually matter what is in this list. If it was n associations or n integers or n strings, we're still potentially having to loop through all n of them. So the kind of thing that was uh, influencing our performance here was the number of things in our list, not so much like what kind of thing uh, was in the list. Does that make sense? Other questions on this? All right. One more. Let's say you are implementing an interpreter for a very spooky programming language called GhostScript. It will let you define horrifying variables that have certain otherworldly values. Uh, which data structure of these four would you use uh, to represent the variables that? are being defined in GhostScript. A few more for D. That's great. Uh, can someone share your, your thinking about why a map might be a good choice in this situation? Well, uh, because it doesn't matter like what order the variables are in as long as you have the key. And it also doesn't matter what the value is. As long as you have the key, you can get the value. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a good point that our variables have a name and some associated value. And when we're in a situation where we have two pieces of data and we want to associate one with the other, that suggests a, a, a map might be a good choice because that is a data structure for specifically making these associations, a kind of key and a value. In this case, the, the name would be the key. Questions on that? Is that making sense? You may have uh, caught on to the fact that I was referencing PostScript uh, in this situation where you did uh, uh, perhaps implement the def command that was uh, allowing someone in PostScript to define a, a variable with some name and some value. Uh, and you may have taken a look in the Lab 3 handout at the symbol table .java. The, the symbol table, you didn't have to implement it, you were just using its methods. Uh, but it might not surprise you to find that it was actually just a sort of uh, a wrapper around uh, Java's hash map data structure, where when for the symbol table, if it was for the symbol table to check if a symbol was in the table, you just check if that symbol's in the underlying hash table. When you are adding something to the symbol table, that's our maps put, put in a key value pair, and get would just be the maps get. Uh, so. Uh, you, you're more familiar with maps than, than perhaps you knew. All right, so when we left off, we were in a situation where uh, our goal was let's Use hashing to achieve constant time put get contains uh, remove big improvement on our, our list map. Uh, who can remind us kind of uh, in in the, the picture of a hash table? Uh, that we built up, uh, what was kind of one component of that picture? What what were we putting the data in? 
Yeah. It's like a column, a hash table. Yeah, I drew this sort of column with slots. Uh, does anyone remember what this represented? Right. Yeah, these slots had indexes all the way down to some, say, size minus one. What would we, in Java, what would we, what would we use if we wanted some structure that had, say, a fixed number of slots named zero through length minus one? Jake? All right. Exactly. So our hash table was just storing our associations, our key value pairs, into an array. Just putting these things in slots of the array. What were we using to figure out which index a given key should, should go to? Is there anything? Uh, yeah, that's where our, our hash function, our, our simple one when x was an integer, was just using the, the modulo operation to turn any integer into one of these indexes. And as far as it went, this was all that we needed to make this kind of magic array, this hash table that could figure out where a key value pair should go in this array in constant time uh, with some kind of hash function. With me so far? Any questions? All right, but we identified uh, a problem where right, we have some objects and that was being turned into an integer and mentioned In Java, this is done with every object has a hash code method that turns that object into an integer. And right, after that point, we then needed to turn that integer into a uh, index into our array. And that was usually accomplished through kind of mod size. But the step that we didn't resolve was, well, what if this index is somewhere in the array that already has something in it? What if we have a collision where two different keys end up uh, going to the same, uh, the, the same index? And so, Our main focus for today is how do we deal with this situation? How do we resolve a collision when it occurs? There was also a question last time of like how, like we have this hash code, is it doing the sort of mod size or, or whatnot? Uh, And at least as far as Java is designed, these kind of responsibilities are the client, whoever is using the hash table, whatever objects they're trying to put in as keys, that part of the code is responsible for this hash code function. So if you implement a new class in Java and you want to be able to use it as a key in a hash table, you will likely want to implement yourself the hash code method for that object. And then Java's uh, standard library that provides us the, as we were looking at the 
patch map class. That's, in this case, the part of the code that is turning whatever integer hash code spits out into an actual index into whatever internal array the hash map is using. And the hash map is also what is handling this collision resolution. So before we get to collision resolution, uh, we might ask, well, is there a way that we can just avoid or make these collisions less likely? So if we have a, uh, a simple um, hash function like this, uh, what about this determines whether we're going to have a collision? Sorry? One or two or more objects have like the same indexes. Yeah, so like what integers we're, we're hashing will affect whether we uh, have collisions, as well as the, the size here. This will also have an effect on whether there are collisions or not. And making the size larger tends to help. Like if we have more spots in our array, less likely that two keys are going to end up colliding at the same spot. But imagine size equals 10. And we have keys 70, 24, 56, 43, and 10. Uh, would any of these keys collide? If so, which ones? 70 and 10. Yeah, 70 and 10, both going to be 0 mod 10. So these two keys would collide. And I might say, well, to fix this, I will, instead of having my size be 10, make it six times bigger. Have I solved my problem? No, I, I, there's no collisions, right? I made it six times bigger. That has to have helped. No? What's, what's, uh, are there still collisions, Jeffrey? It's still going to get you the same, because it's modulus. It's going to get you the same number. Yeah, I still have this issue where 70 mod 60 is 10 left over, and 10 mod 60 is also 10 left over. So I actually have put both of these still colliding at, at uh, not at index 0, but now at index 10. So making the size bigger uh, can help, but what is used most often as practice is making the size bigger and a prime number. Why does this work better? Uh, real life data tends to have patterns in it. And one way to think about this is multiples of 60 more likely to show up in data than multiples of 61. Like you might imagine, uh, maybe we're hashing things based on some time at which an event happened. Uh, or uh, uh, some uh, kind of any, if, if we choose a size to, that might share uh, uh, factors with keys that we're hashing, uh, we're more likely to get, to get collisions, kind of a repeating pattern among, among our keys. So in practice, making the table size a larger prime number can help avoid collisions. How do you determine the prime number then? Like is it, it's not always 61, is it? Yes, yeah, so great question. How do we know which prime number? Uh, I think typically you'll use a similar strategy to what we did with the array list, where we'll start it as a smaller prime number, maybe 11, uh, and then when our hash table, when our array fills up, or when we decide we need more space in the hash table, we'll increase the size to some larger prime number. And kind of do that repeatedly as, as needed uh, to fit when we need to fit more stuff in the hash table. Other questions on our collision avoidance? All right, so 
even if we choose a nice prime number, still can't necessarily avoid our, uh, our collisions. So strategy number one. is something called separate chaining. And the idea here is that each slot in the array that's our hash table is actually a linked list. So as an example, I'll choose a nice prime table size of 11 and say the keys that I'm going to insert will be 11, 24, 106, uh, and 13. Uh, let's get rid of 106. 13 and 46. So and I'll just use the simple kind of uh, integer mod table size to decide what index uh, I'm going to put the key. So I do uh, uh, 11, mod 11, that goes at index 0. So then I have a link list with one node in it at that index that has the key 11. It's index 0. Uh, when I do 24 mod 11, that is 2 left over when I divide it by 11. So that will go at index 2, and I'll put 24 into a linked list there. 13, uh, again, 2 left over when divided by 11. And so I just add that to my linked list. So my strategy for resolving these collisions when two keys end up at the same index is just to keep a list of all the things that belong at that index. And similarly, 46, again, is going to be 2 left over when divided by 11. And I simply add it on to the list. Does this make sense? We just have a uh, yeah. Jeff. I was wondering, how would you like access the um, keys? I got maybe thirteen or forty-six. Uh, good question. If we try and kind of you do, call get or contains with key thirteen, we would apply our hashing function to the key. That would say 13 goes to index 2. And then we would need to search through our linked list at that spot. And check the keys at each node in the list to say, is the key we're looking for, 13, stored in our hash table? It, so do you do the separate chain in combination with like the prime number size always? Yeah, so this prime number size is just like generally a good thing to do. For hash tables, it can avoid some, uh, uh, it just makes it less likely in practice that there will be collisions. Doesn't make it impossible. So we need something, separate chaining or another strategy I'll talk about uh, to answer the question of, well, what should happen if we, if we have a collision? All right, here's a question uh, for you to think about with your neighbors. Uh, it's a data structures friend. <laughs> Under this separate chaining strategy, if we have If we have n elements in our table, what is the worst case behavior for contains uh, if we're using separate chaining? Uh, please take a couple minutes, brainstorm with your, your neighbor what, what that might be. Liam? Um, 
I'm not sure how likely it is, but if they all end up in the same index, like one link would. Yeah, we could be really unlucky, and every single key that we put into the table is just in the same slot, all in the same linked list. And so if we have to look through a linked list with n elements to see if something's in it, what is, what is our big O complexity of, of contains on, on a linked list? Not, not a trick question. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Big O of N. So kind of in the unluckiest worst case, our under separate chaining, our hash table turns into a linked list, and we're very sad. Uh, so for example, uh, if our hash function was hash of a key equals five, terrible hash function, uh, and would give us this kind of behavior. It would put everything at the same slot. In our uh, in our hash table, um, so this sort of like really bad luck or just terrible hash function, pretty unlikely, I would say. Uh, and so we can kind of uh, it's it makes it not worth doing a bunch of extra work to try and avoid this like uh, particularly weird worst case. Because if that happens, uh, it's sort of uh, some, something has gone has gone wrong. Kind of that's outside of the control of the hash table. Uh, so to make this a little more formal, there's an idea called load factor when we're thinking about hash tables. And it's typically represented with the um, uh, uh, letter lambda. So I'm now realizing in, in the notes for today it says gamma, but that's incorrect. It's <laughs> lambda. Uh, so I will fix the notes. Um, and uh, in this case, the formula for lambda is pretty simple. It's just the fraction of the number of spots. Uh, uh, it's the number of things in our hash table divided by the size of our array. So uh, if we didn't have uh, uh, so I guess we can think about the kind of max load factor uh, the max load factor without our separate chaining and with our separate chaining. So if we didn't have separate chaining, if we could only put kind of one thing in one slot, we don't have these lists in each slot, we just have one, uh, one element in each slot, what would our, our kind of maximum possible load factor be? Peter? One. Exactly. That if we can have at most one thing per slot, the uh, we could have all of the slots filled, at which point our load factor would be one. There's no more space in the hash table. How about with separate chaining? Yeah. That's infinite. It is unlimited. As our link list can just grow arbitrarily long and so we can kind of load up uh, even if we had just three slots in our table we could load up a list with hundreds thousands millions of, of elements it'd be pretty slow we would have to be kind of searching through these long linked lists uh, but our 
Our separate chaining allows, in theory, our hash table to hold more things in it than kind of the number of spots in our array, because each spot can have multiple, uh, multiple things in this list. Um, one reason we care about this uh, uh, load factor uh, is that another way to think about it is that when we have separate chaining, our load factor is kind of the average number of things in each of our linked lists. Because we're adding up how many things that there are across all our linked lists and dividing it by the number of lists. That's going to tell us the average number of things in each list. Uh, and to do our contains, we said worst case is big O of n if we have all n things in our in a single list. Uh, but we can actually say kind of whatever the load factor is, whatever the average, uh, I guess this is not quite right because the worst case, uh, but Our kind of average case would be kind of our load factor is the average number of elements in each list. And so we'd expect kind of contains, if it has to go through the whole list, to need to look at an average of whatever, uh, of lambda, uh, an average of our load factor, number of elements to kind of check through any given list. Uh, So for separate chaining, we, uh, an implementation, we usually try to keep our load factor kind of less than, less than two. So if our load factor is less than two, then we can expect most of our lists are very short and we don't have to spend a lot of time searching through long link lists. What are your questions on this? All right, so we'll get to how do we go about keeping this load factor less than two uh, and uh, other potential uh, strategies. But a couple things that we need to do first. Uh, number one is talk about Grover Cleveland, uh, the uh, 22nd president. Uh, complete aside, this image is uh, extremely high resolution so we can get a, a very detailed look at uh, old Grover here um, star staring into your soul uh, so Grover Cleveland uh, was a, a, a Democrat um, elected after uh, uh, the Re Republican uh, Chester A. Arthur uh, uh, didn't run for another term uh, he was something of a reformer, kind of t tackling corruption and uh, uh, also pushed for uh, something called the, the Dawes Act, uh, which was this uh, uh, kind of a change in, in federal policy toward Native Americans that uh, uh, said, well, if we uh, divide up uh, Native American land and... Uh, uh, destroy and replace Native American culture, everything will be good. And this is seen as a, uh, a horrible idea and a, a tremendous injustice, but it was government policy for, for kind of starting in the 1880s for, for a number of decades before it changed. But to me, the most memorable thing of Grover Cleveland is the uh, election campaign, uh, where during that campaign, there was this uh, scandal where 
Uh, supposedly, Cleveland had uh, fathered a, a child outside of marriage with a, a woman from Buffalo, New York, and he would be heckled at campaign events with cries of, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Um, and there would be political cartoons like this, uh, uh, criticizing him for this, uh, this supposed indiscretion. Uh, but I guess fortunately for him, his opponent was a longtime politician named James Blaine, uh, who was so mired in so many scandals that you have this political cartoon where, where Blaine is tattooed with all the different scandals uh, that he's been involved with uh, throughout his career. Um, and so there was kind of no one came out looking good uh, from the, the campaign of, of 1884. <clears throat> All right, second thing we need to do before talking more about hash tables is uh, doing some practice actually using uh, a hash map. Uh, uh, we're going through the details of how something like a, a hash table is implemented because as for all our data structures to know which uh, is the appropriate choice. We need to understand how they're how they're working internally, how they're going to perform. Uh, but uh, unlikely that you would need to yourself implement a hash table from scratch. But you almost certainly make use of them uh, many times. Um, very very useful. Uh, so I want to consider a task where our uh, goal is to uh, count. The number of times each letter appears in uh, the novel Frankenstein. And I have here the text of, of Frankenstein. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll use the uh, in uh, uh, class of the algs4 library. To read in a file, I'll we'll need to import it, uh, and then I'll just say while the input file has another character, uh, my character uh, is going to be uh, read the next character. So while there's an next character in the file, read it. And in order to kind of store the information about how many times each character appears, uh, I can use a hash map and I can import that uh, from Java. So my task for you uh, uh, is to think about what should the type of the key and the value be if I have this hash map that should keep track of how many times each letter appears in some file. Uh, and then secondly, fill in the code inside this loop to uh, actually, as we go through each character, keep track of kind of a, the running count of how many times you've seen each character so far. Uh, and then at the end, we just print out our map of frequencies to see what's in there. All right, so work with the folks around you uh, to fill in these types and this loop. Quack and I will be wandering around to answer any questions. Uh, we'll uh, take about 10 minutes for this and then come back together. All right. Looks like folks are making, uh, making good progress. I uh, want to make sure that we, we talk, uh, talk through this. Uh, someone give me a, a suggestion for what uh, what type of things are going to be the keys and values in, in our hash map, Cam? Uh, we said that the key would be uh, characters and then 
the value would be inserted. Like that? Yep. Uh, that's great. That's what we want. The only thing is Java doesn't like uh, primitive types as these sort of uh, uh, generics, so we'd have to make them uh, the object versions to, uh, to, to, satisfy, to satisfy Java. But it's exactly the same idea as we have a, a char and an int. We just have to use slightly different syntax because Java. Um, all right, great. We have, have our, our hash map set to go. Uh, someone give me a suggestion for what's the first thing I should uh, I might do in this in this while loop. Yeah. Um, an if statement that checks frequencies that contain C. Yeah, and what's that what's that doing? Um, Just to, well, like described in English. Uh, we're checking if like there is already like an integer value. It's not no uh, English. Yeah, I, I might say we're, we're checking if the map already has this character as a key or not. Like, have we seen this character before? Have we put it into, into our map? Uh, Java's hash map let us, lets us check for both contains key and I believe uh, contains value. So it's not just one contains method that takes a key. It's you can check for a key or a value. Um, so someone else. So what what should I do in the case where this character is already in my my map of frequencies? Paul. You need to get the current count or the value of the PC and assign that. Or like you could just do both, I guess. Yeah, or or you're thinking kind of do multiple steps on one line. So how would I combine this get and and put? Yeah, so I would have frequencies dot put and then C for the key and frequencies dot C for the So I'm I'm putting, uh, I know this is already in my map, so is put going to add this key a second time or something else? Jake? Uh, you're going to add plus one. I guess they're probably going to add plus one. Yeah, and, and uh, I think what you're, you're also getting at is this will replace the value associated with this key with one that's one higher. Counting that we've seen this character one additional time. Uh, am I done? Someone have a suggestion for for something I should should add? Elena. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Else, if it if it doesn't contain the key, uh, how would I how would I make a, a new association or or add that to the map? That's it. The add function. I mean, the add method. Uh, yeah. In, in uh, for for our map, that that is our our our. Uh, it gets called put. We don't we don't have something called called add. Um, but yeah, we want to, to put a new uh, a new entry into our map. Uh, what value should go along with this uh, new character entry? Yeah, uh, we have seen it. This is the first time we're seeing it, so we've seen it once. Um, all right, so I think we can try and and give this uh, give this a run, and complete our 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 study of, of Frankenstein. Uh, all right, we have uh, zero appears twice, one appears thirty five times, forty eight colons, nine hundred seventy one semicolons. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, 
Uh, six E circumflex. One E accent. One E the other accent. <laughs> there are some square braces. All right, learning all sorts of things about classic literature today. Uh, all right, uh, questions on on using a, a map to keep track of these frequencies? All right, in the, the uh, new lab out today, uh, you will be using uh, a kind of more, slightly more sophisticated version of this kind of analysis of like counting up how many times each letter happens to take something like Frankenstein and generate new random text that is kind of in the same style as Frankenstein. So to show you what I mean, uh, let me go to here. And so uh, there's uh, if I run this uh, this program, uh, and you'll see in the lab right up there kind of different levels of this analysis we might do. But if I say level eight and uh, do it from from Frankenstein, uh, we get this random text. Uh, her hair. Her fair hair was thus reduced to exile of her mother, was a girl of five, person of a mariner, equally neglected. Like, it's just sort of nonsense, but it kind of has the same feel as Frankenstein because it's uh, based on, on data from there. Um, but if I look at a version that doesn't use a hash map and uses our list map instead, so we go from uh, constant time to linear time, and I try and do the same analysis, I'm going to be waiting a very long time because I'm building up uh, this uh, large uh, hash table, uh, this large map, uh, and in the case of the hash map, as the map gets bigger, still stays constant time. But I'm, when I use uh, uh, something that is has linear performance like the list map, the bigger the map gets, the slower it gets as its performance is in terms of n. And so uh, performing this analysis of the text would be uh, really slow if we didn't have this uh, kind of new tool that we've been learning about hashing. So uh, it's... Um, like ha being able to go from linear to constant time really changes what what we can what we can ask a computer to do. Okay, so have a few minutes. Want to talk about one other uh, strategy for collision resolution? And it is called probing, although the reading has uses a, a less common name for it, which is open open addressing. Uh, but I think most most sources call it probing. And the uh, key ID here. Is that when we have a collision, instead of having these lists that sort of chain out, uh, we're just going to use empty spots. As if we have, uh, if we have a side, table of size 11, and we're inserting these four keys, well, we definitely have space somewhere in the table for these four keys, because the keys are only size 11. Or, or the, the table size 11, and we only have four keys. So. One way that we might use uh, uh, empty spots is say, if the index uh, uh, hash uh, of the key is uh, x mod size, uh, if this is full, We'll just try the next spot in the hash table. 
So we'll just try the next spot uh, uh, down in the hash table. And if that's full, we'll again just try the next spot down in the hash table. Uh, and we'll kind of just keep trying the next spot in the next spot. So change this picture to what that would look like. Zero, one, two, three, four. Winsert 11. That's all good. It's an open spot. We insert 24. That's all good. It's an open spot. We insert 13. That spot's taken. So then we just try to the next spot. And if that's open, great. We'll just put 13 there. Insert 46. That would go to index two, but that's full, so we try the next one. That's full, so we try the next one. It's open. Great. We can put 46 there. Choke. What if everything is full? Uh, if everything is full, we're out of luck. We can't put anything uh, uh, into the table, which again is why load factor is very important. And basically, this strategy works OK. Uh, but gets really slow as the load factor gets high, because you end up having to kind of skip over large sections of the table. Uh, so when our load factor gets greater than maybe 0.5 or maybe 0.7, uh, uh, there's kind of, but kind of greater than, than some uh, reasonable fraction. Then we would make the table bigger. And so this is in our, when we had the array list. It was when it completely filled up that we then doubled the size and copied stuff over. When we're talking about our hash table, it's when it gets some amount full, when our load factor passes some threshold. So when it gets more than half full, we expect the kind of performance of this, this probing strategy to get really bad. So at that point, we're going to make the table bigger. And then we don't just copy it over. We need to go through all the keys and to reapply our hash function to figure out what index they go to. Uh, because our hash function includes the size of the table. And so if we change the size of the table, which index various keys go to may change. So when we change, so when we make the table bigger, we need to rehash, go through and figure out, okay, where is the new spot that each key is going to go in our, in our bigger table. But this means that our hash tables can be extensible, can grow as we put more things into them, just like our array list could. All right, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, please take a look at the new lab. Uh, these, uh, the three labs we have left are uh, kind of bigger in scope and you have more time to do them than the previous labs. I cannot emphasize enough how this is not a reason to like take five days off of homework and then try and do the lab at the end. You will be very sad if you take that approach, so please start early, and I'll see you in office hours tomorrow night or on Friday.